the book of the Nazarim and the book of John the Enlightened of Elohim were included together in a text known as the Gospel of the Kaleidi, meaning wise strangers. The origins of this work are debated, as no original manuscripts have ever been found. However, it is commonly believed that the books were preserved and passed down by Celtic believers in the 1500s after previously being saved from arson, possibly either the burning of the Library of Alexandra or the Glastonbury Abbey fire in 1184. It has been tucked away alongside a secular work known as the Colburn. However, they don't remotely share any similarities. Whether this is a complete and divinely inspired text can certainly be debated. Nevertheless, we do believe that it contains the words from our Messiah that were not captured in the canonical gospel accounts. As stated by the Apostle John, if everything the Messiah did were recorded, all of the books in the world could not contain them. In this volume, you will find astonishing parables, new and old, that will challenge your walk. Join us as we test this book, allowing the Spirit of the Most High to guide us unto what is true. Shabbat Shalom and welcome brothers and sisters. Welcome to the Parable of the Vineyard YouTube live stream of our new series, The Book of Nazarim Reading and Study. My name is Adam, your host, and I welcome you. Brothers and sisters, I am so excited to share this book with you. I don't even know where to start. Let's just start with prayer, if you don't mind. Father, yeah, we just come before you and bless you in your son, Yahushua's name. We thank you for salvation. We thank you for showing and exposing the lies of this world, Father, and drawing us unto you, showing us that your, your Torah is eternal and has not been abolished, Father, and to be walked out with all seriousness, Father, with love, loving you and loving people with all of our heart, soul, and mind. And we just ask that your Ruach, your Spirit, would guide us as we study and test this book, O oh, Yah. And we just bless you and thank you in Yahushua's mighty name. Amen. Hallelujah. So where to start? Man, I don't even know. So some people might ask right away, like, what is this book? Why are we studying this book? Is it in the in the Bible? If it's not in the Bible, why are we studying it? I want to start here with a passage, if you don't mind. I think this might be a good place to start. Actually, let's do Shofar and then we'll get into, we'll get started into the study. All right, so we're going to start here in the book of Two Esdras. Just in case you're new, if you're like, uh, Adam, what's the book of Two Esdras now? The, two, the book of Two Esdras was included in the 1611 KJV under the Apocrypha section. Messiah quoted it verbatim. Uh, this was considered scripture for many, many years, but it was taken out of our Bibles in the mid-1800s. So let's start here, and, and I think this is incredibly important to kind of set the stage as to why we're even reading this book, and hopefully it might make a little sense to you. So it says, this is 2 Ezra, uh, chapter 14, verses 44 through 48. Just to give you the, the back story, um, all, the bi all, all the scrolls, all the scriptures were burnt when the, uh, uh, when the Babylonians uh, destroyed Jerusalem and the, uh, the, the Jews were sent into exile. They destroyed everything. So years later, Ezra, the prophet and priest, was speaking with the Most High and was like, Hey, I can I can teach the people and I can share truth and I can reprove them, but what about people that come later? What are they going to do? Because your Torah has been burned, your your writings have been burned. How are they going to find the path in the last days? So the Most High granted that all the scriptures would be rewritten, and so Ezra was uh, was given five scribes to write everything. So for forty days they wrote. So here we go. So forty. So during the forty days, ninety four books were written, and when the forty days were ended, the Most High spoke to me, saying, "Make public the twenty four books that you wrote first, and let the worthy and unworthy read them." Let me pause there real quick. The Tanakh, the Hebrew Tanakh, which is what we call the Old Testament, is comprised of twenty four books. Now some of you say, "Well, no, it's thirty nine. Well, in the Hebrew Tanakh. A lot of the books are condensed into one. For example, the Minor Prophets, you know how there's 12 books of the Minor Prophets? Well, in the Hebrew Tanakh, that's one book. And other books are likewise, they're, they're condensed. But the same thing that we have in the Hebrew Tanakh, to, or the Old Testament today, 
the 39 books is the same thing as the 24. So the Most High says, these 24 books are made public. Everyone can read these. The worthy and unworthy read them. But keep the 70 that were written last in order to give them to the wise among your people. For in them is the spring of understanding, the fountain of wisdom, and the river of knowledge. And I did so. And this is the knowledge of Messiah hidden through these books. But the point is, the Most High can make public books he wants to, and he can hide books if he wants to. So back then, it says 94 books were written. So 70 were not included in the quote-unquote canon that we understand. Now it's just Old Testament. Who knows uh, in the New, the New Testament era or the, um, you know, the, the, the testimony of Messiah, how many books were, were kept there? Another uh, verse I'd like to read for you is with that mindset that the Most High, He can hide books and He can reveal books whenever He wants to. Would we agree on that? That's up to you. Proverbs 25, 2 says, It is the glory of Elohim to conceal a thing, but the honor of kings to search a matter out. I don't know about you. I view the Most High's word as treasure. It's the most precious thing on this earth. We love our family. We love our children. We, we, you know, our flocks, are our, you know, whatever. But the word is the most important thing. It's the greatest treasure that we can search out in this world, greater than anything. And that's how I view it. And so when I come across books and I read them, I test them, that's what I look for. I am looking for the treasure. So if it's it's Elohim's glory to conceal it, and it's the honor of kings to search it out. I don't know about you, but I like to have that honor to search these things out. Not declaring myself to be anything, but I want to search these matters out. As we said in the intro, John 21, 25 says, and there are, also, I'm sorry, there are also many other things which Yahusha did. In case you're new, we understand our Messiah's name to be Yahusha. Some say Yahshua, some say Yeshua, Yahushua. We're all brothers and sisters. We love you. We just understand it as Yahusha. So if during this study, if you're like, who's Yahusha? That's how I understand the Messiah's name. There are also many other things which Yahusha did, the which, if they should be written every one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. Amen. That's what John said. So is it plausible to believe that there's more of Messiah's words that were not all captured in the four gospel counts? I would say yes. And I'm of the understanding that the Most High preserved some of our Messiah's words to be revealed in these last days through what's called the Book of the Nazarene. So let's uh, let's also recognize this. Paul said this, 1 Thessalonians 5, 21, prove all things, hold fast that which is good. This reading that we're going to do, we're going to read through this book and we're going to test it and hold fast what's true. So we're going to abide what, what, what Paul says. So uh, let's go ahead and get to the book and we're going to read the foreword and then we're going to get into it. So this is the books of the Nazarene and the Enlightened Ones. It was formerly called the Gospel of the Collide. Well, the Gospel of the Collide took two books. There's two books included in this. By the way, there's a free PDF that we've created. Uh, it's free and available to all. It'll be in the description box and the pinned comment below. That way you can download this for free and read it and test it for yourself. So there's two books in here. It's called the Book of the Nazarene and the Book of John or Yehuchanan, uh, the Enlightened One. And so those two books were combined into one book called the Gospel of the Clyde. Uh We've kind of restored that to its original name, the Book of the Nazarene, which if you're not familiar, Nazarene means branches. That's one of the four, the prophesied titles that his people would have is um, the, the Nazarene, the branches. And it's, this comes from John 15, where he says, I am the vine, you are the Nazarene. So some people ask, what do we call ourselves? Are you are you Jews? No. Are you Hebrews? Well, yeah. Um, you know, what's your denomination? I don't know. We're Nazarene. Let's read the book of Nazarene. So the foreword. <clears throat> some of this was in the intro, but we'll read it again. It's important. The book of the Nazarene, commonly translated as Nazarene or Nazarene, and the book of Yahuqanan or John, the enlightened of Elohim, were included together in a text known as the Gospel of the Kaleidi, meaning wise strangers. The origins of this work are debated as no original manuscripts have ever been found. It's true. So some people were like, some people may stop here. There's no manuscript evidence. I'm out. Hey, I understand. I totally understand. And I don't I don't blame you. However, I also believe that the Most High can preserve it in any way he wants to. However, it is commonly believed that the books were preserved and passed down by Celtic believers in the 1500s after previously being saved from arson, possibly either the burning of the Library of Alexandra or the Glastonbury Abbey fire in 1184. 
It has been tucked away alongside a secular work known as the Colburn, and I've heard many people talking about this book. This book is pretty interesting because it actually also includes an account from the Egyptian point of view of the plagues in Egypt, the Exodus. It's, it's a second witness that our, the scriptures are true. It's amazing. But the, the, we're not here to promote the Colburn at all. However, they don't remotely share any similarities. It is more likely that they were both passed down through the same or a similar group of people in timeline. Whether this is a complete and divinely inspired text can certainly be debated, and I'm sure there will be much of that. Nevertheless, we do believe that it contains words from our, our Messiah that were not all captured in the canonical gospel accounts. So that is what this right here is why I'm reading it. I believe that our Messiah is, he spoke words of life life-changing things like life-changing parables life-changing uh teachings and this book contains more of those and that is why i'm eager to get these out i've read this several times already i can't put it down um quite a few of uh brothers and sisters that have read this already for themselves have all unanimously agreed that this book is profound and that it does contain words from our messiah and that's why I'm so enthusiastic to bring this forth to the community. I believe that we can grow and grow greatly from this book. As stated by the Apostle John, if everything Messiah did were recorded, all the books in the world could not contain them. John 21, 25. In this volume, you will find astonishing parables, new and old, the new bringing deeper convictions and a sincere desire to look within oneself. This is hands down and the old being expounded upon greatly the timing of these books beginning to circulate is encouraging as more and more believers are waking up to the true gospel salvation in messiah alone and the importance of keeping the torah of the most high a concept confirmed again and again in this text this book is very pro torah certain scriptures such as matthew 5 17 through 19 are clarified in this book to mean exactly what the Ruach HaKodesh, that's the Holy Spirit, has already been revealing to many of us that the Torah is still for us today and that it's awesome. Here, so here's the Matthew 5, 17 through 19 parallel in this book. I have not come to abolish the Torah or to change the teachings of the prophets, but to complete them, adding any necessary clarification and interpreting them to the understanding of men, much like we see in Matthew 5. You've heard it was said that um, you shall not murder, but I tell you, if you hate someone from your heart, you know, such and such. That's adding necessary clarification. But the time has come to ask, when will they be put into practice? When will men bring Yahweh out of the temple and make him a participant in their daily lives? When will men carry these things in their hearts and stop paying them lip service. I say with certainty, so long as earth and the heavens above it remain, not even the smallest particle shall be deducted from the Torah until the purpose it serves has been completed. Therefore, if anyone try to avoid even the least obligation imposed by the Torah or to set aside the slightest of its restrictions or teach others to do the same, he will be an insignificant thing in the life to come. A little more serious language here. But whoever lives by them, quoting Deuteronomy 30 and Romans 9, 10, leading others to do likewise will achieve the greatest heights of glory. Book of the Nazarim 9, 41 through 42. Please note this text has been revised to restore the sacred names of the Most High and His Son, as well as the original names of people and places. It is also separated into two separate books, which were formally compiled together under the title, The Gospel of the Kaleidi. Chapter and verse numbers have also been added for ease of reference. It is also important to mention that it was reported among early assembly writers and historians that scriptures were already being tampered with. Justin Martyr testifies to this and cites a couple examples in his book, Dialogue with Trifo. Trifo. Arrhenius also talks about it in his work, Demonstration of Apostolic Preaching. Upon examining this document, we encountered a few out-of-place passages that oppose the rest of the text. In chapter 19, we have included brackets and actually other places, and italicized the portion we found to be potentially added, altered, or the true meaning lost in translation. If you'd like to read the original for yourself, you can find it here. There's a link. So if you want to read the, the version without the, the revised names and chapter verses and such, there it is right there. Here's another, uh, another um, little excerpt I want to share with you. Some disciples came to Yahusha and asked whether they should not withdraw into the wilderness where they would dedicate their lives to Yahuwah. Yah Yahusha said, 
Of what use would my teachings be in the wilderness? Are you going to save rocks from sin or convert camels? Will you enlighten the wind or give wisdom to mirages? Where is the benefit if what you learn cannot be put into practice? Learning and good conduct must go hand in hand, and the greatest wisdom is that which teaches men to live in harmony. They who seek to escape, and listen to this, this is, this is very important because I know there's nothing wrong with living on homestead and those kind of things, but there are certain people that I know are withdrawing and this is not what he wants us to do. They who seek to escape the tests and trials of life are cowards. Are you going to withdraw from the conflict through lack of courage, standing silently by while the wicked swallow up the good? Book of Nazarim 4, 41 through 42. It's time to step out in faith and be the light he has called us to be. May this be a blessing to you and your family, and may the Ruach of Truth guide you in all things. Edited and compiled by myself and Victoria Fink, my wife, Parable of the Vineyard Ministries. So, as we mentioned before, this PDF is for free. You can download it at any time you'd like. So, there, like I said, like I mentioned before, there's two books. We're actually going to skip the book of Yehokan on the Enlightened of Elohim. We're going to do that after we're finished with the book of Nazarene. I want to get straight to it's straight to Messiah's words. That's the true gem in this book, and I am so excited to go over it with you. So this is going to be a non-biased study. Uh, we're going to expound upon the good and point out errors because there is errors in this book. Uh, big shocker. Um, I'm not too concerned about that. Let me tell you why. Um, because if we if if we throw out this book because there's an error or two, we have to be fair in all things. Matthew 25, 5 through 9 says, and he, this is talking about um, Judas. And he cast down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. And the chief priest took the silver pieces and said, It is not lawful for to put them in the treasury because it is the price of blood. And they took counsel and bought with them the potter's field to bear the strangers in. Wherefore, that field was called the field of blood unto this day. Then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremy the prophet, saying, And they took the thirty pieces of silver, the price of him that was valued, whom the children of Israel did value. So this is wrong. Uh, it says by the book of Jeremy. This actually is from the book of Zechariah. And so this, my point is, do we throw out the book of Matthew because there's a scribal error? No. What we look for is things that would take us away from the truth, things that would take us away from Messiah, things that would take us away from keeping the commandments of the Most High. That's what we're looking for. Scribal errors, it happens. I mean, look at, um, look at we have the Masoretic text, we have the Septuagint, and they disagree. They disagree on, on uh, years of birth or how long people lived, but do we throw one out because of that? No, I think we have to understand that there's going to be scribal errors. The Most High has allowed His Word to be placed in the hands of men, to be translated to... Um, I mean, even Messiah, you know, even, it was even quoted in Jeremiah, uh, the lying pen of the scribe, things like that. So um, I'm not so hasty to throw out a book just because there's, uh, there might be an error there. What we're looking for is doctrine, and that's what's most important to our walk, to our study, to our faith, is the, is the doctrine. Is it pure or not? And that's what, uh, that's what I'm interested in. So this book contains treasure, and I'm excited to reveal that together with you. So with that being said... Let's get started. I know that was a long introduction, but I, it was very necessary for this book because I know um, this is very new to a lot of you. So let's get started. Book of the Nazarene, chapter 1. The birth of Yahusha the Nazarite, who became our master and interpreter of Elohim and the Torah, a worthy vessel for the greatest manifestation of the power of the Ruach HaKodesh seen on earth occurred in this manner. About the time Yahukanon, the forerunner, commenced teaching the way of the wilderness beside the Yardan, and the year before Herod died, when Augustus Caesar ruled the Roman world, a babe was born. So this is a slight uh, contradiction because we know in the book of Luke, it shows that they were about six months apart. This book is uh, stating that Yahukanon was older when Messiah was born. Doesn't change, uh, doesn't change the... Uh, um, the overall storyline doesn't change any of um, what we're, what the treasure we're really looking for in this book. So just wanted to point that out. The father was Yosef, son of Heli, a carpenter of Galilee, and the mother of Miriam, his wife, who had been a virgin pledged to Yahuwah, and the temple by her father Shimon, son of Yehoiakim, son of Nathan, son of Eleazar. And this, uh, this, uh, this testimony here is... Um, confirmed by multiple witnesses of New Testament Apocrypha. Uh, I think it's the Gospel of Peter and a few other books. 
A decree had gone out that all who claimed kinship within the house of David should be gathered for enrollment in the city of David called Bethlehem in Galilee. Therefore, Yosef, being rightfully born in the stock of David, took the scroll of his parentage and went to Bethlehem so his kinship could be established. Now, Miriam, being then heavy with child, longed in her heart to be among her kinsmen, and she prevailed upon Yosef to take her, for Bethlehem was only a day's journey from them. The two, with a servant, came to Bethlehem at eventide, but because so many had gathered, the inns were filled. Then, as Miriam's time was close upon her after the journey, a man took pity on her and provided a cave used as a stable. This is also confirmed in uh, multiple New Testament Apocrypha accounts. There the travelers found shelter and rest. And I think this is interesting because we know uh, Messiah was called the second Adam. Well, uh, according to multiple accounts, Cave of Treasures, um, first Adam and Eve, that as soon as Adam and Eve came out of the Garden of Eden, they went into a cave, the Cave of Treasures. So I thought it would be very interesting that uh, Yahusha, also known as the second Adam, uh, was also uh, born and raised essentially in a cave. Adam and Eve had to stay in that cave for quite some time. That night, Miriam's labors came upon her, and she suffered the pangs of childbirth and cried out in pain. Nearby, some shepherds were tending sheep, for in the midst of so many strangers, these needed protection, and, hearing her cry, went to help. They provided a shepherd's basket, which was filled with straw and placed in it the manger, and the newborn babe was wrapped in clothes brought for him. After eight days had elapsed, the child was named Yeshua, meaning one who delivers, for an angel of Yahuwah had appeared to Yosef in a dream, saying, That which lies within Miriam, your wife, is filled with the power of the Ruach HaKodesh and will respond to the hopes of men. Later, men called him Yahusha, and because he fulfilled their hopes and was anointed with the power of the Ruach HaKodesh, he became acknowledged as the Messiah. So what's kind of interesting here is uh, having kind of two names. We know that Joshua was a prototype for Messiah, and we see the exact same thing. He had his name essentially was just salvation, and then his name was later changed to Yah is salvation, which Yahusha or Yahshua uh, would properly denote. And we see that here in Numbers 13, 16. It says, These are the names of the men which Moses sent out to spy the land. And Moses called Oshea or Oshea or Hosea, uh, the son of Nun, Jehoshua. So uh, he kind of added, you know, his name was originally Salvation and his name was changed to Yah is Salvation. This would be Yahushua or Yahushua, however you want to pronounce it. So kind of a, a similar pattern here. Um, now, verse 8, this is one of the, we see the brackets here. This is a verse that we had a problem with. Um, originally, we were going to just take these out, but um, thanks to a, a, a brother who encouraged me to keep the, the text as it was, but just point out the errors and uh, chew the meat and spit out the bones, as they say. Now, the stable was against a hill behind an inn where sages from the east were staying, men of Sestera, which I believe this is um, another word for the Chaldeans, wise in the books of heaven and of Nimrod, who carried the cross of fire. Don't know what that means. So Yosef sent for them, requesting they come and foretell the child's future, for such was the custom. I do believe more properly translated this would have been prophesy over them. Either way, this passage really is a little bit out of, out of place, and we're just going to go right past that. Um, let me just pause here real quick. These first two chapters are really just kind of history. There's not a ton of meat here. If you stick with me, there's starting in chapter three, there's amazing treasure. And maybe this is how uh, the book is, is meant to be to kind of keep people away. I'll tell you, um, I give, I give a lot of thanks to brother Dave Courier, good friend of mine, um, who shared this book with me. When I first read this book, when I started like the, like right here, I was like something in me, I was like, you know what? I'm thinking I'm just gonna just put this down. And then I just, I, I like, I was like, no, let me just keep reading. And I kept reading and I'm so glad I did because this is, this book is absolutely amazing. But I, I believe that it's possible that Hasatan allowed, uh, or, or, or employed men to put things into this text to be like, ha, I don't know. Either way, I, I'm going to stop making, uh, I'm going to stop apologizing. We're just going to keep reading. One of the sages said, It is strange indeed, for this child is born under no usual star, but under one that is a star in appearance only and not in nature, having a power not in other stars. He is destined for greatness and will motivate events touching the lives of all men. And I think this is interesting because I do, you know, the, the, the wise men or, or the, um, the men from the East, 
it said they were they were wise in in um, the the wisdom of, of Nimrod, and we know that in Nimrod's time there was the astrologers and and the um, those kind of people. In the book of Jasher, we see that it was these same men, these men of Nimrod, who saw the forecoming of Abraham when he was born. He was born under an unusual star, and they knew what its meaning was that. This one was going to destroy Nimrod's kingdom and that his seed would, would uh, inherit the earth. And so it's only fitting, I believe, that um, these men from Chaldea again would also proclaim Abraham's seed, the seed, not, not seed as in multiple, but the seed, which is Messiah. Verse 10, when word of this was passed around, there was much excitement among those belonging to the house of David and many, remembering the prophecies of Jehokanon, John, for they had passed his way, wondered in their hearts, is this not he for whom we wait? The consolation of the Yahudim and deliverer of men. This displeased the people of Bethlehem who awaited another deliverer. When the sages spoke of the matter, I'm sorry, when the sages spoke of the matter at their journey's end in Jerusalem, and word came of the excitement among those of the house of David in Bethlehem, there was great consternation among the priests and learned men. They tried to discover where the babe was, but the sages answered deviously and said his star points to the east. An elder of the house of David, attending the blessing of the child on the eighth day, lifted up his voice and declared, Surely this is he who has been promised to redeem us out of the hands of evil. This is he upon whom the power of the Ruach HaKodesh, that's again the Holy Spirit, will descend, bestowing strength, compassion, and wisdom. Surely he will rule in the kingdom of Elohim. When the king heard about these things and that a babe had been born who many claimed was destined to be the deliverer, he was greatly disturbed and summoned the council. With the council were learned scribes and elders who disputed among themselves concerning the babe. Some said that while Yahweh's anointed would be born in Bethlehem, the deliverer would not, for the birth of Yahweh's anointed in that place had been foretold by the prophets, Micah specifically. Others said it might not be more than an enlightener who was expected to be born at that time. However, when many agreed that Yahweh's anointed and the deliverer might be the same person, the king sent three men to discover the child. Now, this is interesting because there's actually it's it's a it's actually a prevailing teaching in Judaism today that the Messiah. There's two Messiahs. You have the son. You have Messiah's son uh, Ben Yosef and Messiah Ben uh, David. So you have the the suffering servant and you have um, the the conquering king. However, we have come to understand and, and know the truth that he's one and the same. So back then they had a dispute that no, there's 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 two of them. There's one this one and there's that one. But then there's also men that were like no, the same person. The dispute before the council had been long, and Yosef had been forewarned. So when the men sent by Herod came to Bethlehem, Yosef had departed with his family. They went to the place where the kinsmen of Miriam lived, which, Egypt. The men who came did not search long for Yahushua, for after the council had been dismissed, Herod slew the son who sat with him on the throne, as he had slain others of his blood. Later, Herod, him, Herod died himself, but after these happenings, the Romans did not bestow the title of king on any Yahudi, and it was unlawful for any man to claim the title. In this manner, the prophecy was fulfilled, which said, A virgin shall give birth to a son, naming him Elohim with us. So yes, this book does claim that Messiah is Elohim. In English, he is God. We'll, we'll find distinctly in this book, also as the, the canonical accounts uh, show us that he is the son of the Most High. He's not the father, but he is the son, but he is an eternal being. He's Elohim with us. He will be the bearer of knowledge, discriminating between good and evil. But before this is given to the people, the land will lose its kings, referencing Isaiah 7. Therefore, Yahweh himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call, call his name Emmanuel, Elohim with us. Butter and honey shall he eat, that he may know to refuse the evil and choose the good. Before the child shall know to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land that you abhor shall be forsaken of both your kings. Pretty interesting. All right, chapter, or chapter 1, verse 17. When time had passed, Yosef and Miriam came to Jerusalem and stayed at the house of a relative, a man strongly set against wrongdoing and well learned in the Torah. The forty days having been accomplished for the purification of Miriam, she came to the temple, and Yosef offered the prescribed sacrifice and dedicated the child. 
Hearing from Yosef and Miriam the things which the sages had foretold about the child Yahusha, the devout man took the babe into his arms and praised Yahuwah in this manner. Because the things foretold have come about, your servant is prepared to depart in peace. For my eyes have been gladdened by the deliverer of my people, a beacon of light for others, and the glorifier of your name. He will teach all men the ways of Yahuwah and how to walk in his paths. Which, again, as we'll continue to see, this text is so pro-Torah. So swords shall be made into plowshares and spears into billhooks, and peace will reign over men. Quoting Isaiah 2. Verse 20. Yosef and Miriam could not understand the meaning of this and asked what it was meant. Whereupon the man replied, I hold a sapling which will grow into a sturdy tree under the shade of which many nations will find peace. Yet he will also test the strength of our people, tearing them apart in dispute. He comes as a separator, dividing the sheep from the goats, showing each his rightful place. He will place a sword in the hands of the weak and strengthen them, and the ungodly will be smitten. After complying with the requirements of the priestly law, Yosef and Miriam returned with the infant to their home in Galilee, a small place in a hollow at the foot of a hillside. In this text, confirms what Luke also testifies to, that they were not rich. And we find that in uh, Luke 2, 22 through 24, which says this, And when the days of pur purification, according to the Torah of Moses, were accomplished, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to Yahuwah. As it is written in the Torah of Yahuwah, every male that opens the womb shall be called set apart or holy to Yahuwah. And to offer a sacrifice according to that which is said in the Torah of Yahuwah, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. What's interesting about that is this was offered for someone who could not afford the main offering. And we'll see that here in Leviticus 12, 6 through 8. And when the days of her purifying are fulfilled for a son or for a daughter, she shall bring a lamb of the first year for a burnt offering and a young pigeon or a turtle dove for a sin offering unto the priest, unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, unto the priest who shall offer it before Yahuwah and make an atonement for her, and she shall be cleansed from the issue of her blood. This is the Torah for her that has born a male or female. Now listen, and if she be not able to bring a lamb, then she shall bring two turtles, turtle, turtle doves, or two young pigeons, the one for the burnt offering and the other for a sin offering. So the point is, she didn't bring the lamb. She just brought the two turtle doves, which meant they couldn't afford it, so they were not wealthy, which confirms what's here. They lived in a small place in a hollow at the foot of a hillside. There the child grew up, developing a strong body and keen mind, for he was strangely talented. He was wise beyond his years and deft with his hands. That means crafty and skillful. And when old enough, he began learning the craft of plow making. His parents, following the custom, went each year to Jerusalem for the festival of deliverance. This is the Passover, the Pesach. And when Yahusha was twelve, they went as usual, but this time taking him with them, having remained the seven days of the festival. Yosef and Miriam set off to return home, but let the boy linger in Yerushalayim, for a kinsman of theirs was also returning, and they thought Yahusha was in his company. Having gone a day's journey and finding Yahusha was not with his kinsmen, they became perturbed, and at first light in the morning returned to Yerushalayim. It was some time before they found Yahusha in a small outside room of the temple, sitting before an instructor of the priestly law. His parents were astonished at finding him accepted among learned men, and the teacher expressed amazement at the child's love of learning. But Miriam scolded the boy for his inconsideration, saying, We have suffered much during the search for you. Yahusha replied, Why search for me elsewhere, knowing I must concern myself with the work of my father? This saying disturbed the instructor. Neither could his parents understand the meaning of the reply. But they took the boy away with them. Henceforth he always obeyed his parents. But Miriam kept these things in the storehouse of her heart. As Yahusha grew up, his intelligence increased, and he was well liked by all, but he was a solitary child given to much wandering. So maybe like a loner? Um... I don't know, not like a loner, like like in a negative sense, but like he liked to be alone and probably ponder things and things like that. But um, just a confirming passage in Luke 2, and Yahusha increased in wisdom and stature and favor and favor with Elohim and man. And the reason I say this is because 
we're going to we're going to talk about this more in this book is that he had a, even though he was Elohim a, a an eternal being that was with the father and created everything he literally came down and he became a man and so he had to grow up he had to increase in wisdom he had to learn he had to um, go through trials and, and which we'll see more about in this book we'll see more of the human endurance that he had to partake um, but this book does confirm that he he is Elohim um, but it gives us a more of a uh, understanding of what he had to endure because it's like if he if he didn't come down as a man and that he was literally just Elohim that came down here and didn't have to suffer these things we learn about in the book of Hebrews that he had to endure everything all the tri trials and temptations that we did so that he could be even even more long suffering uh, high priest anyways chapter 2 Yosef died when Yahusha was a youth at that time working as a craftsman among the Kenites. After Yahusha had been away a long time, he returned to the house of his brothers. One day, while he worked under the shade of a tree, they came to him and said, Out in the wilderness by Yarden, or the Jordan, there is a man who cleanses people by immersion in water, baptism. He claims strange knowledge and calls himself the forerunner. We are going to see what he teaches. Yahusha says, I have heard of these things, and surely as the son of our forefather Yishai, Pray, that's the son of Jesse, and of course this is talking about David. Sometimes this is talking about Psalm 51. Pray to be cleansed of his secret faults and presumptions. The sons of our father should not stand aloof from cleansing. I will go with you. The brothers of Yehusha said, This man is called Yehokanon, or John. He heralds the coming of an enlightener who will be an all-wise instructor in goodness. He himself does not bear this new light which will dispel the darkness in men's minds. He tells of one who will grant men the privilege of becoming the children of Elohim, awakening to eternal life, that part within them not born of earthly desires. Let's talk about the privilege of becoming the children of Elohim, and that's what Messiah offers us. And we ought to be so grateful for this opportunity and gift that's been given to us. John 1, 9-12 that was the true light, which is talking about Messiah, which lights every man that comes into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of Elohim, even to them that believe on his name. Hallelujah to that. First John 3. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of Elohim. Therefore the world knows us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of Elohim, and it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. Can you imagine that for a second? For we shall see him as he is, and every man that has this hope in him purifies himself, even as he is pure. Whosoever commits sin transgresses also the law, the Torah, for sin is the transgression of the Torah. And ye know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. Whoever abides in him sins not. Whoever sins has not seen him, neither has known him. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that does righteousness is righteous even as he is righteous. And righteousness is defined as walking in the Torah. That's how we know Messiah was righteous. He walked completely in the Torah of the Most High, perfectly without fault, declared righteous. Now, while he washes us and makes us clean of all the sins that we have partaken in, do we just jump back in the mud like a pig does after being washed? No. Elohim forbid, the book Second Peter 2 tells us specifically not to be like a dog that eats back, eats its vomit back up, or like a pig that gets washed that goes jumping right back in the mud. So we've been cleansed. Now let's walk in cleanliness. Let's walk in righteousness. And he gives us the Ruach HaKodesh to give us that power to do so. All right. Chapter 2, verse 5. So Yahushua and his brothers went out seeking Yahukanon, finding him beside the Yardan at the place of crossing where there was a pool. The hairs on the head of Yehokanon were already white. So again, this book kind of alluding to that John was much older. Um, there is also, um, you know, there is uh, something to take into consideration. The book of Jubilees, which I do I do like, but it has some, some errors as well. But anyways, um, there, there's a couple, there's a passage here I want to share. 
First of all, we know that John is prophesied here in Malachi 4, verses 5 through 6. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of Yahuwah. He shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. So we know that the manifestation of the spirit of Elijah was John the Baptist. Let's go to Jubilees 23, 16. It says, In that generation the son shall convict their fathers and the elders of sin and unrighteousness and of the words of their mouth and the great wickedness which they perpetrate and concerning their forsaking the covenant which Yahuwah made between them and him that they should observe and do all his commandments and his ordinances and all his laws without departing either to the right hand or to the left. Now, what's interesting, scrolling here, it talked about the hair on John's head was already white. There's an interesting passage here in Jubilees. Uh, it says here, And the heads of the children shall be white with gray hair, and a child of three weeks, in, in this book, a week is seven years, so 21 years old. And it says, And the heads of the children shall be white with gray hair, and a child of three weeks, 21 years old, shall appear like an old man of 100 years. Kind of, I don't know. I don't know what to do with that, but just something to consider. Yehokanon, so chapter 2, verse 6, Yehokanon, seeing Yehusha among those gathered about him, said, Look, all of you, here he is, a man in whom there is no guile, the true Lamb of Elohim. He knew. The one we await, for Sethel, don't know who this is, sending me forth to baptize, instructed me thus, When you discover a man worthy to be the receptacle of the Ruah HaKodesh in abundance, the same shall you acknowledge as the Enlightener. Hearing these words, Yahushua joined with those to be cleansed. But when he stood before the forerunner in the water, Yehuchanan said, You have greater powers of cleansing than I, yet you come to me? Yehushua replied, The power to cleanse and revitalize with the Ruach is not in men, but in the Ruach which fills man. It is important each should be allowed to do whatever he is called upon to do. Yehushua asked of Yehuchanan, What do you know about me? Yehuchanan said, Years gone by, I had a vision of three heavenly lights, and as the sun sank, so they rose. A flame of fire went up over Yerushalayim, and smoke filled the temple. Listen to this. And a star fell down into Yehuda. Those of you that know um, uh, your Torah pretty well, this is finally where we can see this passage fully manifested. The meaning I know of, for this, this for it was this, the deliverer is born, and woe unto the house of Herod. Woe to you, scribes, and your interpretations of the Torah. Woo! We're going to get deeper into that right there. But we see this in um, Numbers 25, verse 15. And he took up his parable and said, Balaam, the son of Beor, has said, and the man whose eyes are open has said, he has said, which heard the words of Elohim and knew the knowledge of the Most High, which saw the vision of the Almighty falling into a trance, but having his eyes opened. I shall see him, but not now. I shall behold him, but not nigh. There shall come a star out of Jacob. And a scepter shall rise out of Israel and shall smite the corners of Moab and destroy the children of Seth. And Edom shall be a possession. Seir also shall be a possession for his enemies. And Israel shall do valiantly. And out of Jacob shall come he that shall have dominion and shall destroy him that remains of the city. So this is that star. Messiah, who is that star, of course, that will rise. And this is what we see here. Yeah. Okay, let's, uh, let's keep going. Chapter 2, verse 11. The star that appeared and stood over Yerushalayim was a child planted into Bethlehem from out of the heavenly heights. So we see that he literally came from heaven. This book declares that. As was foretold, and it was prophesied that he would be the deliverer. The fire that burned was the fire of a strange altar. I prophesy great things for you. You are the true son of Elohim. Soon you will see the glory of heaven revealed, and the power of the Ruach HaKodesh will be poured out upon you as a stream of pure water. The time has come to proclaim yourself. Peace. Peace on you whom our Elohim has chosen as his messenger. For you will proclaim the true gospel. Strengthen your heart, for the road ahead is steep and stony. No man is hated. Listen to this. Ooh, this passage is good. No man is hated so much as one who tries to point out defects in character and attitudes and seeks to guide men along the path of right and beneficial living. And this is why... The Pharisees and scribes hated him because he was pointing out their defects. And instead of humbling themselves, they were like they hated him. But in general, the righteous are hated. We know that. Matthew 5, 10 through 12, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when men revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. 
Rejoice and be glad. We need a whole mind shift when this happens. Rejoice and be like, praise ya. For your reward is great in heaven, for so men persecuted the prophets who were before you. Isaiah 59, 59, 15 says this, Truth is lacking. Torah is lacking. And he who departs from evil makes himself a prey. Literally, when you depart from evil and want to walk in his ways, you're hated. You become a target. Listen to this. Wisdom. Wisdom of Solomon. Also, in case you're new, Wisdom of Solomon was also included in the 1611 KJV under the Apocrypha section. It was also included in the Greek, Greek Septuagint. This is chapter 2, 12 through 20. This is talking about the, the righteous are hated. Let us lie in wait for the righteous man because he is inconvenient to us and opposes our actions. Anyone that's ever read or seen um, Pilgrim's Progress when they went through Vanity Fair, just because they didn't want to participate in their evil, they were hated. He's inconvenient to us and opposes our actions. He reproaches us for sins against the Torah and accuses us of sins against our training. He professes to have knowledge of Elohim and calls himself a child of Yahuwah. He became to us a reproof of our thoughts. The very sight of him is a burden to us because his manner of life is unlike that of ours and his ways are strange. We are considered by him as something base and he avoids our ways as unclean. He calls the last end of the righteous happy and boasts that Elohim is his father. Let us see if his words are true and let us test what will happen at the end of his life. For if the righteous man is Elohim's son, he will help him and will deliver him from the hand of his adversaries. Let us test him with insult and torture, that we may find out how gentle he is and make trial of his forbearance. Let us condemn him to a shameful death, for according to what he says, he will be protected. Let's get back to the book of Nazarene. Chapter 2, verse 13. Then Yehuchanan took Yahusha down to the river and baptized him. And he was overshadowed by the Ruach HaKodesh and became fully filled with its power. So his face glowed, and the people wondered and were bewildered, for they did not understand. Yet the face of their forefather Moshe had also glowed after he had been in the presence of the Ruach HaKodesh of Yahuwah. Yehuchanan said, Go and wait upon the mountainside nearby. Later, Yehuchanan went to join Yahusha and told him that he was the anointed one but should not yet make this known to the people. Then Yehokanon prayed thus, We give thanks, O Yahuwah, with souls purified through realization of our misdeeds, and ruachot, or spirits, reaching upward to commune with, with you. It is by your power alone we have seen the light of truth manifested and come to know the secret of your hidden name. Ooh. In humility, we call you by the name of Father because you have shown us a Father's compassion and kindness, and because we know you chastise and discipline us after this manner of a Father. You have granted us freedom of activity that we may enjoy the blessings of life. We have been saved by the waters of your affection. We approach you as the only good and great being, asking only that we be united with you in the waters of the Ruach and never become separated from the source of life. This is how Yahuknan testified concerning these events. On that day, the Ruach outflowing from Elohim came with a great surge of power. I did not know this man from others, but seeing him, I recalled what I had been told by those who gave me the power to cleanse with water. They had said, when you find someone so filled with the power of the Ruach HaKodesh, he can hardly contain it. You will know him for one who will baptize with the cleansing power of the Ruach HaKodesh. I have experienced his power and testified that this man is the true son of Elohim, the enlightener and deliverer, the same one, right? Because the Jews thought, thought there would be two different ones. Verse 18, Yehuchanan left Yahusha on the mountainside where he stayed three days fasting and communicating with the powers above. Then he went back to the riverside. Yehuchanan was standing with two of his disciples, Yehusha sitting apart, and Yehuchanan said to those with him, there is the one giving himself as an offering to Elohim, the enlightener of the world and the deliverer of our people. Then the two disciples went to Yehusha and said, Tell us about your teachings. Shall we follow your way or that of Yehokanon? Yehusha said, There is the way of the wilderness, and there is my way, alike in teaching, but calling to different men. What Yehokanon teaches accords with the Torah, even as my teaching. Obey either or both, they are of the Torah. From that day forth, Yehusha had power to heal the sick and to do many things, but he went out into the wilderness bordering, bordering the Jordan, the Yardan, uncertain about his next move. While there, 
hungry and thirsty, he fought with the flesh, resisting the temptation to go down among the habitations of men and use his powers for selfish ends. So let's pause there. That may be a passage where you're like, well, let's talk about this again. Luke 2.52, And Yahushua increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with Elohim and man. Like, like a man, he has to increase in these things. Let's also look at Hebrews 4. Seeing that we have a great high priest, this is verse 14, that is passed into the heavens, Yahushua, the son of Elohim, let us hold fast our profession. Listen, for we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. So, even though this, this may seem interesting, wow, what, Yahushua was tempted with misusing a power? That's, that's a, one of the great temptations of men, misusing power. So he fought it through prayer and fasting, much giving us an example to do the same. The same ruach of, so back to this point, this reason this is important is because it's like, it's like the, a, real, a good leader, like a good leader, like I think about in the military, a good leader is one that did everything that he's telling us how to do. I don't know if that makes example, a good example. So like, let me give a better example. Okay, so like, like in I, I used to be in the business world. I was in the sales world, and I felt that I could be a, a more effective trainer or leader for salespeople because I did sales myself. I I experienced all the things that a salesperson experiences, knowing uh, the hardships, the trials, um, the things that come your way. And since I did that, later on got promoted to being a sales manager and trainer, I was able to train them better because I know, I get it, I've done that. And here's how uh, I was able to overcome this and overcome that. So in a much greater way, in a whole life sense, Messiah is going through all these things that we go through, all the emotions, temptations, trials, so that he can better help us and guide us, that he can show us an example of how it's done, number one, but also in the Ruach, of course, that he can help us, guide us through everything. First John 4, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of Elohim, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Hereby know you the spirit of Elohim. Every spirit that confesses that Yahushua, uh, Hamashiach, is come in the flesh, is of Elohim. Come in the flesh means, means become human. And every spirit that confesses not that Yahushua, Hamashiach, is come in the flesh, is not of Elohim. And this is that spirit of Antichrist whereof you have heard that it should come and even now already it is in the world. So we have to understand that the Son of the Most High, the, an eternal being, came down and became a man and was tested with all these things. All right, chapter 2, verse 22. The same Ruach of Yahuwah which overshadowed Yahusha overshadowed the creation. It enlightens our outer darkness and bestows life and is eternal. Yehokanon was one of those who can see the Ruachot of men, the spirits of men. And so he knew the nature of Yehusha. These things took place at Beth Arba, which means the place of crossing. So there's the first two chapters. If you're still with me, praise Yah. Some cool things there, but chapter three and beyond, this is where it gets really good. So if you stick, if you stuck it out, hey, now uh, I really believe that a, a really amazing reward comes from not reward of just hearing these words okay chapter three let's see coming from the wilderness yahushua still retained the full power of the ruah hakodesh having it on trusteeship from elohim he would not use it unworthily at night it shone around him like a pale blue haze and though many have it never has another manifested it in such strength Two followers of Yehokanon, the forerunner, one being Andrew, the brother of Shimon, were sent by him to be with Yehusha and accompanied him to the Galilean Sea of the Gentiles. Early in the morning, Andrew sought out his brother and said, We have found the deliverer. But at the time, Shimon thought another was meant. When Yehusha had known Shimon for two days, he said, You are strong, silent, and steady one likely to be ever steadfast in conflict. So uh, it looks like, uh, if this is true, an account looks like uh, the, uh, oh, what's that show? Um, 
the chosen got got his personality a little bit wrong. One likely to ever be steadfast in conflict. Therefore, you shall be called Kepha. This meaning the rock in the tongue of the Gentiles. And from that day, Kepha became a follower of Yahusha. Passing along the shore, they came upon the tower of fishermen. A boat was being unloaded by its owners. One who accompanied Yahusha said, Those are good men known to me. Then Yahusha spoke to them while sharing a meal and later said, Fishing is a good life, but there is a better one. Follow me and you will become fishers of men. So placing their boat in the keeping of others, they followed Yahusha. At this time, Yahusha spoke with caution, for the people still recalled Yahuda the Galilean who had smitten the Romans in battle. Yahusha was a man of long silences, and many thought him strange, but he taught all along the shore of the Galilean Sea and called others to follow him. They worked wherever they could, for Yahusha said, What we offer is not to be sold like a common chattel or common, common good, and we will not take anything without giving value in return. He healed many, saying, It is not I, but the power from above with me. Some of the disciples said, It is truly he who heals. But he did not cure all, for in some it created a disturbance, while many were not cured because this would have done them more harm than good. Pause right there. This might hit home for some of you out there. They're like, I've been praying about this illness that I have or so, or a loved one or a wife or a spouse or wife or spouse, same thing about a spouse or a, a coworker or a mom or dad. I've been praying for it. And it's like, why, 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 why have that not been healed? Why has my child not been healed yet? Let's read this again. But he did not cure all for in some it created a disturbance while many were not cured because this would have done them more harm than good. Let's pause there. How could that be? Why? Psalm 119, 71, It is good for me that I have been afflicted that I might learn your statutes. It's very possible that he hasn't healed somebody because through these afflictions, they have to grow closer. And through these trials of afflictions, that the you know impurities need to be burnt off. And this is how we draw closer to him. Jeremiah 30, verse 11, For I am with you, says Yahuwah, to save you, though I make a full end of all nations where I have scattered you, yet I will not make a full end of you. But listen to this. But I will correct you in measure, and I will not leave you altogether unpunished. Jeremiah 30, verse 15, Why do you cry for your affliction? Your sorrow is incurable for the multitude of your iniquity, your sins. Because your sins were increased, I have done these things unto you. Hebrews 12, 6 through 8, For Yahweh, love, for whom Yahweh loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure chastening, Elohim deals with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chastens not? But if you be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then you're bastards and not sons. So this chastening, this chastening could be from Yah directly for our own good. I have a testimony of that. Some of you that have met me in person, especially for an extended period of time, um, I, pain is something that I, it, is, it was part of my testimony. Uh, it's through pain, physical pain, literally like not being able to get out of bed for weeks at a time pain that I, I really started to seek him with all my heart and really wanted to be refined. That pain is, is what I needed. I, as much as I hated it, I needed it. Um, there's a passage in the book of Nostrum, chapter 8. I don't want to take too much from the rest of the book, but there's sometimes where there's some passages that we're just going to have to read in parallel. This is from chapter 8, verses 25 through 26, and says this, When they arrived back at the place where the crowd was gathered, there was a man lying in their midst with a greatly swollen leg, which had crippled him for many years. He said to Yahushua, Master, I have been a sinful man and I've been punished. Yahushua said, Be of good heart, for your suffering has compensated your misdeeds. Whoa. It's true. I with Before I even read this book, I've told people, a lot of people ask me like, Adam, why are you like limping around and what's wrong? And I told them of my, you know, my, um, my testimony and I've shared, you know, I've, I've got a, a thorn in my side. Of course, I would love if y'all would just relieve me of this one day. What a, what an amazing miracle. Um, but I often thought that because of, uh, the passage we read earlier in Jeremiah, and now this confirms it, that though we're forgiven, Sometimes, especially those of us who lived extremely terrible lives, me, sinful lives, 
in my past, pay for it. Though Yahusha paid for it and bore, and, and he bore our cross, he bore our, our sins on the cross, that doesn't mean we won't go altogether unpunished. And I believe that, that that pain was literal punishment for me. And so when I read this book, I was like, oh man, that totally confirmed it. Yahushua said, be of good heart for your suffering has compensated for your misdeeds. Some of you may not like that, but hey, I don't know. All right. Oh, whoops. We are at uh, chapter 3, verse 10. Okay. So let me just say this. For those of you out there, um, if you haven't been cured yet, endure. What if he just wants you to continue? What if there's a little bit more refinement and you're just right at the end of that time period that he's he has allotted for you to be in pain or to to suffer and it doesn't it doesn't just purely to physical pain this could be emotional pain it could be um, financial it could be uh, family issues uh, it could be work related it, it could be so many different things in your life that you're just like praying and praying and praying like why aren't you delivering me and let's just read this again um he said he did not cure all. And it doesn't have to be just literally physical healing. For in some it created a disturbance. While many were not cured because this would have been done them more harm than good. So maybe, just maybe, he knows you better than you think than you think you know yourself. And it's not time yet. Just something to consider. All right. Verse 10. When asked, how do you heal? Yehusha replied, by the finger of Elohim. This is what the prophets had said regarding these things. These are the words of Yahuwah. I will restore you to health and heal your wounds. Be strong of heart and courageous, neither afraid nor dismayed, for I am with you always. We know this is all throughout the Torah, but this is interesting here. It says, I will restore you to health and heal your wounds. Now, what I find interesting is where we got the doctrine to, to confirm this right here, that some are going to have to suffer in pain. We got that from Jeremiah 30, right? What's interesting, I find this is this right here. He's quoting Jeremiah 30. Is that a coincidence? Well, probably not, because just a few verses later, he says here, For I will restore health unto you and will heal you of your wounds, says Yahuwah, because they called you an outcast, saying, This is Zion, whom no man seeks after. And just don't forget, it was just a few verses earlier that we learned that because of our sins, we had to endure these things. Right? Why do you cry for your affliction? Your sorrow is incurable for the multitude of your sins. Because your sins were increased, I have done these things unto you. I find that fascinating. I don't believe in coincidences here. Verse 11 of chapter 3 of the book of Nazarim says this. About this time, the disciples questioned Yahushua concerning the world of Ruach or the spirit world. He's like, they're like, let me ask some questions about the spirit world. Wherein lay the kingdom of heaven? And he said, it is like a flight of stairs leading from cellar to roof, which reminds us, of course, of Jacob's ladder, right? They have this ladder going and you have spirits going up and down. They who enter the house are given a place on the stairs. And so, let's say we are chosen people who are going to be entering into the kingdom of heaven. They who enter the house are given a place on the stairs and may step downwards and back. So they can go backwards and they can leave, but never up. Though the stair above is not unknown to them. Heaven is not unknown to us. Those on the top stair are in glorious sunshine, angels, while those at the bottom are in darkness and gloom, wickedness. Interesting little parable. A disciple said, many who do not Come, mock your words. Yehusha replied, dogs bite stones, not those who throw them. So it's just, it's kind of interesting. Um, and this kind of goes along with like, you know, gossip and slander. And it's like just people mocking words and not going to people directly. It's just, it's kind of interesting. Someone asked, are you the hammer of Elohim? For all yearn for Elohim's intervention. And when that comes, we'll rejoice saying, this is the day of Yahuwah for which we have long awaited. Isaiah 25 reference. Let's just read it real quick. And it shall be said in that day, Lo, this is our Elohim. We have waited for him, and he will save us. This is Yahuwah. We have waited for him. We will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Nazarene chapter 3, verse 14. Yahushua answered, There is a time for sowing and a time for reaping, everything to its appointed time. So they're like, Are you here to like deliver us? Like they're like, Are you here to destroy Rome so we can like be free again? And he's like, there's a time for everything. A time for sowing and a time for reaping. So, of course, he's sowing right now. That was the whole parable of the sower. A sower went forth to sow the seeds. 
Yahusha gathered his followers around him and taught as follows. These days are a night of ignorance when all is dark. But I am the light which will dispel the darkness. My light will light your lamps, and you too will become bearers of the light. I am the light to point the way, and none can find the way to Yahuwah except by the light. Incredibly important passage. Uh, those of us that already understand this, uh, this will be a review. But so those of you that are new, I don't know how many new people actually watch this. Um, but hey, if you're here, praise Yah. This is some meaty stuff we're going to get into. Proverbs 6.23, we're going to define this. For the commandment is a lamp and the Torah is light. The Torah is light. Psalm 119.105, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. So his word, literally. Psalm 18.28, sorry. Psalm 18.28, for you will light my candle. Yahweh will enlighten my darkness. Psalm 19, 7 through 8, the Torah of Yahuwah is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of Yah is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of Yahuwah are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of Yah is pure, enlightening the eyes, giving light to the eyes. 1 Peter 2, 9, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, into obedience of the Torah. So let's read this again. Now that we understand the definition of light, Yahusha gathered his followers around him and taught his followers. These days are a night of ignorance when all is dark. Why? Because so, even the lawyers, the people who taught the Torah, were more interested in man-made teachings and doctrines rather than the Torah of the Most High. And of course, all the, 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 he's the heathen nations around that could care less about the Torah. But I am the light which will dispel the darkness. My light will light your lamps and you will too become bearers of the light. I am the light to point the way and no one can find the way to Yahuwah except by the light. So no one can go to him but by the way of the Torah. This is the way he instructed. I come to testify concerning the Father. For those following my way will see Elohim in the light of the Father. Does not a father chastise in love and punish with affection? Does he not give you tasks only just within the power of your accomplishment? We're going to talk about that in a second. Even as with an earthly father, so with the heavenly father, who is infinitely, infinitely greater. Being flesh, we understand earthly ways. But the ways of Yahuwah may be also known and understood, for his Ruach resides in all men. Of course, that's the, not the Holy Spirit, but the, the, the breath of life. Does so here this part here? Does he not give you tasks only just within your power of accomplishment? I, I want to um, I want to expound on that because this is a very important part here that we all have a part to play, big or small doesn't matter. But he gives us, and he I, I believe truly that we're going to be judged not of our total body of work, but what we do in the calling he's given each and every one of us. Sirach three seventeen through twenty three says, "My son, perform your tasks in meekness." Then you will be loved by those who Elohim accepts. The greater you are, the more you must humble yourself. So you will find favor in the sight of Yahuwah. For great is the might of Yahuwah. He is glorified by the humble. Seek not what is too difficult for you, nor investigate what is beyond your power. That's a, I think that's an important one. We, I think we should all recognize where we're supposed to be. Reflect upon what has been assigned to you. For you do not need to need what is hidden. Do not meddle in what is beyond your tasks. For matters too great for human understanding have been shown to you. We'll also go to Matthew 25, the parable of the talents. For it, it will be as when a man going on a journey called his servants and entrusted to them his property. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. So Yah recognizes what our abilities are, and he gives us tasks that are not too difficult for you. So again, does he not give you tasks only just within the power of your accomplishment? And I think that we can truly apply that to our lives, and I think we need to be in a place where we recognize this. Let's also go to the book of Nazarene, uh, chapter 7, verse 24, real quick. Uh, verse 24, <clears throat> listen to this. A carpenter does not do the work of a potter, nor does a weaver make plows. A pupil may not be a good teacher, nor a servant a good master. Each must seek only to excel in the position he has, and not to be better than others at their own tasks. This is so important. I've seen this in the faith. I've seen this where 
I mean, you've got like ministries that compete with each other. And it's like, what are we talking about? We're in the same field. We shouldn't be like competing against each other. We should work together. But anyways, so each must seek only to excel in the position he has and not to be better than others at their own task. Whoever supports me, that person will I support. And I will strive with those who are against me. Let's go back. Let's go back. So where are we? We're in a verse 16. No, we've already done. So verse 17. All right. Book of Nazarene 317. Be upright in faith yourselves and teach uprightness and truth. Fear no man, especially the rich and powerful, for they live in servitude to their possessions and position. Both. It's not just riches. It's also position. He's going to teach us more about that in this book about position. You must carry the light to many, the truth, the Torah, but few will be those who light the lamp of their lives from it. I think we can agree that we live in a day and age where this is very true. Do not covet riches, for though few men possess them, all who do are not free, but are themselves possessed by their wealth. Because riches are the possession of a few, all seek them. Even so are my words. Were they possessed by all, none would value them. It's good stuff. This is really where it starts getting really good. So we're supposed to carry the light to many. We're supposed to carry this truth. Let's see. Yeah. So let's remind ourselves. Your righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, and your Torah is the truth. Psalm 119, 151. You are near, O Yahuwah, and all your commandments are truth. Psalm 56, 4. In Elohim I will praise his word. In Elohim I will put my trust. I will not fear what flesh can do unto me. So it says here, Fear no man, especially the rich and powerful, for they live in servitude to their positions. So don't fear them. I will not fear what flesh can do unto me. Psalm 118.6, Yahweh is on my side. I will not fear what command do unto me. Who cares? Let's talk about the rich. Ecclesiastes 5.10, He that loves silver or money shall not be satisfied with silver or money nor he that loves abundance with increase this is also vanity and i've mentioned this in a few studies i I had a very interesting time in my life where i worked directly under uh, i'm pretty sure he's a millionaire uh and um he was a he was a very successful contractor and i saw i saw his addiction and love for money even though he had plenty more than enough uh and a very good successful business I would I would see him try to cheat out customers out of sometimes like it would be like a 50 60 70 thousand dollar job and just like nitpicking over a couple hundred bucks and like cheating him out of it and I'm like wow it's never enough is it it's never enough it'll never satisfy you and, and that was really when I understood understood the scriptures that money will never satisfy you and that was earlier in my walk and um, I part of my testimony is I had from the time I got out of the Marine Corps when I was like 23 or 24 I can't remember from that time till my early 30s uh, I made a lot of money I was not not like rich considered rich or or uh, that but I'm you know in throughout my 20s I made six figures which is a lot for being in your 20s and so I bought what the world was selling that you know money will buy you happiness and i bought all the things that i wanted and i just over time i'm like why why am i still why i still hate myself why are none of these things making me happy right but this power this passage is so powerful and we're going to talk he's going to talk a lot more about money in this um in this this book that really uh really changes the mind and anyway so this is setting the stage here but really what we should be searching after Proverbs 2 says this, my son, if you will receive my words, hide my commandments with you. This is the real riches. So that you incline your ear into wisdom and apply your heart to understanding. Yes. If you cry after knowledge and lift up your voice for understanding, if you seek her as silver or money and search for her as for hid treasures, then you shall understand the fear of Yahuwah and find the knowledge of Elohim. And again, this is again why I'm reading this book or studying this book with you, testing it publicly together with you, is because... 
I find that there's some treasures here that I have not found anywhere else. And I don't want to sit on this treasure. I want to share it with anyone who listened. I don't I don't expect this study to be a popular study. Uh, that's not why I'm doing this study or any studies is to be popular, but to do the mission that I've been called to do, which is to um, a big part of the, the ministry that I've been, I feel like I've been called to do is to restore these books that were hidden uh, during the time that Yahweh calls us to do it. And I believe that this is the time that this book is to be restored. So we're going to go to Book of Nazarene, chapter 4, verses 38, 37 through 38. Um, and I want to share a couple more things about money or riches. Some really some passages that really hit home. Um, chapter 4, verses 37 through 38. The, listen to this. The rich are responsible for providing the needs of the poor, whether by work or food. This, above all, is the prime responsibility of wealth. And if a rich man says this he cannot do, then his riches witness against him. For if a poor man has a loaf of bread, he will share it with he who has none. And a beggar at the door of a poor man receives better treatment than he does at the doors of the rich. Yet the rich have the most to give, and this is the sin of the wealthy. Listen to this. Riches of themselves are not sinful. Case in point, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. It is what they make of men that brings them into ill repute. If they were properly regarded as something permitting the possessor to study the books of wisdom and to redress the wrongs of the poor, then they would serve a good end. Let the rich ask themselves with sincerity, Am I not wealthy because of my lack of charity and the exploitation of others? Is it not because I love myself more than my neighbors? Whew. These passages hit home. They really do. They should hit home in all of our hearts. I'm not saying this hits, hits home like I'm a rich guy and I should like, I'm just saying like these passages, they really, they, I don't know, maybe I'm just hyping it up too much. Maybe I'm just, I don't know. Okay. So we, we saw also here, you must carry the light to many, but few will be those who light the lamp of their lives from it. So we're to carry the truth to many. Acts 13 verse 47 says, For Yahuwah commanded us, saying, I have set you to be a light of the nations, that you should be for a salvation unto the ends of the world. So this is the this is the apostles uh, quoting Isaiah 42, I think, 42 or 43, um, that they're to carry the light. So this is exactly what Messiah says, that he's going to light our lamps and that we're to carry that light to many. But few will be those who light the lamp of their lives from it. I've been doing this long enough to know that I've been sharing this with people and with just most, the majority of people that just like, no, no. But listen to this. Because riches are the possession of a few, all seek them. Even so are my words. Were they possessed by all? None would value them. He's seeking for the few. He's seeking for the precious. Just like we look at his words as precious. He looks at his people as precious. To Ezra 7, 45-61 says this, I answered and said, O sovereign master, I said then and I say now, blessed are those who are alive and keep your commandments. But what of those for whom I prayed? For who among the living is there that has not sinned? Or who among men that has not transgressed your covenant? And now I see that the world to come will bring delight to few, but torments to many. For an evil heart has grown up in us, which has alienated us from Elohim, and has brought us into corruption and the ways of death, and has shown us the paths of perdition and removed us far from life, and that not just a few of us, but almost all who have been created. He answered me and said, Listen to me, Ezra, and I will instruct you, and will admonish you yet again. For this reason the Most High has not made one world but two. Whereas you have said that the righteous are not many but few, while the ungodly abound, hear the explanation for this. If you have just a few precious stones, will you add to them lead and clay? So it's like if you got like rubies and emeralds and all this, would you like want to like mix clay into those gems? He's like, uh, I said, Master, how could that be? And he said to me, not only that, but ask the earth and she will tell you. Defer to her and she will declare it to you. Say to her, you produce gold and silver and brass and also iron and lead and clay. But silver is more abundant than gold, and brass than silver, and iron than brass, and lead than iron, and clay than lead. Judge, therefore, which things are precious and desirable, those that are abundant or those that are rare. 
I said, O sovereign master, what is plentiful is of less worth, for what is more rare is more precious. He answered me and said, Weigh within yourself what you have thought. For he who has what is hard to get rejoices more than he who has what is plentiful. So also will be the judgment which I have promised. For I will rejoice over the few who shall be saved, because it is they who have made my glory to prevail now. And through them my name has now been honored. And I will not grieve over the multitude of those who perish, for it is they who are now like a mist, and are similar to a flame and a smoke. They are set on fire and burn hotly and are extinguished. So the, the point of this is, he looks at us as like the precious gems. And I believe that we look at his words as the same. Even so are my words where they are possessed by all, none would value them. And that's why I believe it's it's just another reason. They're, they're treasure. They're absolute treasure. Okay, uh, we're going to go a little bit longer. I think we're going to go to about verse 26. And we're going to end the study for this uh, part one. So, Book of Nazarim, chapter 3. Verse 19, one said to Yahushua, Master, we are not all like Yahuchanan, John, who could surely eat bread made with sand. We learn in we learn even more so in the book of John, the Enlightener, which we're going to do after this whole book is done, that he it just shows more of just how a hardy and tough man he was. But they ask, is there no easy way? Yahushua said, the only easy paths in life lead nowhere or are cut by others. But the path I point can be cut by none but yourselves. A peddler going from place to place is willing to undergo the hardships incurred through his wandering in order to earn his livelihood. Even so should you be prepared to cheerfully accept the hardships imposed by life in order to gain glory in the life which follows. Strong passage. Again, 2 Esdras chapter 7, very powerful passage, says this. When I had finished speaking these words, the angel who had been sent to me on the former nights was sent to me again. And he said to me, Rise, Ezra, and listen to the words that I have come to speak to you. I said, Speak, my master. And he said to me, There is a sea set in a wide expanse, so that it is broad and vast. But it has an entrance set in a narrow place, so that it is like a river. If anyone then wishes to reach the sea, to look at it, or to navigate it, how can he come to the broad part unless he passes through the narrow part? Another example. There is a city built and set on a plain. It is full of all good things, but the entrance to it is narrow and set in a precipitous place, so that there is fire on the right hand and deep water on the left, and there is only one path lying between them, that is, between the fire and the water, so that only one man can walk upon that path. If now that city, this is New Jerusalem, eternal life, is given to a man for an inheritance, how will the heir receive his inheritance unless he passes through the dangers set before him? I said, he cannot master and he said to me, So also is Israel's portion, for I made the world for their sake, and when Adam transgressed my statutes, what had been made was judged. And so the entrances of this world were made narrow and sorrowful and toilsome. They are few and evil, full of dangers, and involved in great hardships. But the entrances of the greater world are broad and safe and really yield the fruit of immortality. Listen, all that to, to say this. Therefore, unless the living pass through the difficult and vain experiences, they can never receive those things which has been reserved for them. Sirach, Ecclesiasticus, also included in the 1611 KJV under the Apocrypha section, also in, in considered scripture for a long time, also included in the Septuagint, and another amazing read, My Son. This is chapter 2, verse 1. My son, if you come forward to serve Yahuwah, prepare yourself for temptation. Set your heart right and be steadfast, be firm, unwavering, and do not be hasty in time of calamity. Cleave to him and do not depart, that you may be honored at the end of your life. Accept whatever is brought upon you, and in changes that humble you, be patient. For gold is tested in the fire and acceptable men in the furnace of humiliation. One day, just one day, we're going to have a mindset change that's going to, that, that's going to spring up within us and be like, I, ha I accept the challenges. I am going to endure the challenges. And instead of the middle of the challenges, be like, take me out of it. What do I need to learn? What do I need to learn? How can I be refined? Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for everything. Just like Job says. Blessed be the name of Yahuwah after you lost everything. Book of Nazarene, chapter 3, verse 21. If a child is not raised with austerity, we're going we're gonna to define austerity in a second, can it enjoy the pleasures of life, later life? 
or the foolish parent overindulges the child. And if it is done in the name of affection, the parent is either a hypocrite or irresponsible. Let's look at austerity. It's actually, instead of the definition, we're going to look at the thesaurus uh, for austerity. Um, austerity, the rigor. And this kind of goes into what the, the verses we just read about life is hard and it's meant to be. Ch training a child with prudence or self-discipline. So, anyways. Some of the other ones. Puritanism. Uh, chastity. Economy. Sobriety. Temperance. Strictness. So, again. If a child is not raised with austerity, it cannot or can it enjoy the pleasures of later life. Only the foolish parent overindulges the child. And if it is done in the name of affection, like, oh, I love my child. I just love him. The parent is either a hypocrite or irresponsible. Let's read uh, another part of Sirach, chapter 30. This is about rearing children. Very important. So I want to expand on what Messiah is talking about here, about raising a child with strictness with economy with self-discipline with correction correction is important regardless of what the what the world teaches i i believe what scripture teaches and that's why the i think the world is in in danger because of its doctrines sirach 30 1 through 13 he who loves his son will whip him often some people will be like yeah you're crazy this is scripture and guess what the book of proverbs says the same thing in love I would just share with you that I know some parents are, are completely against this, but this is what the scriptures teach us, regardless of what our heart thinks. It's like, oh, I can't do that. This isn't, this isn't talking about like beating them up. This is talking about a just good old, good old fashioned spanking on the butt. In order that, listen, he who loves his son will whip him often in order that he may rejoice at the way he turns out. He who disciplines his son will profit by him and will boast of him among acquaintances. He who teaches his son will make his enemies envious and will glory in him in the presence of friends. The father may die, and yet he is not dead, for he has left behind him one like himself. While alive, he saw and rejoiced, and when he died, he was not grieved. He has left behind him an avenger against his enemies and one to repay the kindness of his friends. He who spoils his son will bind up his wounds, and his feelings will be troubled at every cry. A horse that is untamed turns out to be stubborn, and a son unrestrained turns out to be willful. Pamper a child, and he will frighten you. Play with him, and he will grieve you. Do not laugh with him, lest you have sorrow with him. That doesn't mean you can't ever laugh, and this is just saying, don't be like a, you know, a jokester with him all the time lest you have sorrow with him. And in the end, you will gnash your teeth. Give him no authority in his youth and do not ignore his errors. Bow down his neck in his youth and beat his sides while he is young, lest he become stubborn and disobey you and you have sorrow of soul from him. Discipline your son and take pains with him that you may not be offended by his shamelessness. Now, again, as a parent uh, myself, I do not like spanking my children. I'm sure much like the father doesn't like punishing us. I'm sure he'd much, much rather us just walk in the straight and narrow path that he told us to do and not go to the left or to the right. But because he loves us and he doesn't want us to go far, doesn't want us to stray off the path, chastens us. In the same way, we must be with our children. So here, Messiah is making this point. All right. Book of Nazarene, chapter 3, verse 22. Now, close by there was a well, and the disciples were drawing water for drinking. Yahushua called them over and said, Do you find this water refreshing? They replied, Yes. We have drunk our fill and are refreshed. Yahushua said, Does any water remain in the well? They replied, Master, this well is inexhaustible and cannot be drunk dry by any number of men. Then Yahushua said, It is even so with my teachings. What I have revealed so far is but a small portion of the whole, yet it suffices for the present needs. The people among whom we go are perverse and headstrong, and like a thirsting ass, can be given only sufficient to ease their pressing need. If they say to you, this is beyond our understanding, or you have told us only in part, recall this well and the refreshing water you obtained from it. Let's talk about this for a second, about his teachings, his word being the water. And we've been likened to plants that grow. Let's talk about this for a second. Here in Isaiah 55, we get a pretty cool little look at this. Isaiah 55. Ho, everyone that thirsts, come to the waters. And he that has no money, come ye and buy and eat. Yes, come and buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Hearken diligently. Listen to me. 
And we know that the Torah teaches us that hearkening to him means obeying his commandments. The same thing the Messiah said, that my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. If we're to follow him, we do the same things he did. So if he's obedient, we're obedient. If he kept the Sabbath, we're going to keep the Sabbath. If he disregarded all the man-made teachings of the Jews, we're going to disregard all the man-made teachings of the Jews. If he ate clean, we're going to eat clean. If he kept the feast days, we're going to keep the feast days. Hearken diligently unto me, and eat you that which is good, and let your soul delight itself in fatness. Incline your ear, and come unto me here, and your soul shall live, and I will make an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure mercies of David. Behold, I have given him for a witness to the people, a leader and a commander to the people. Behold, you shall call a nation that you know not, and nations that knew you not shall run unto you because of Yahweh Elohim and for the Holy One of Israel, Messiah. For he has glorified you. Seek ye Yahuwah who he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. And let him return unto Yahuwah. And he will have mercy upon him. And to our Elohim for he will abundantly pardon. Hallelujah. I am a witness. Or is anyone else a witness out there that he's been merciful to you? That he's forgiven so much? That we all had this debt we could not pay, but he lifted up that burden, that guilt from off our shoulders because we truly believed in Messiah. And praise Yah, he's raising up a generation, a nation, an army to walk after his ways. The Torah that so many have said has been done away with for centuries. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, says Yahuwah. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Listen to this. For as the rain comes down, so he's giving us a picture in the world that we can understand. For as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven. Oh, it's so beautiful. It just snowed a couple inches here. It's beautiful. Everything was white. Even stuck on the trees was amazing. And returns not there, but waters the earth and makes it bring forth in bud that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall my word. So just like the rain comes down and waters and plants grow, so shall my word be that goes forth out of my mouth. And his, his, his true doctrine comes down to us. And this is what we're referencing here in the book of Nazarene, that he's saying that his teachings is like a well that never dries up. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereunto I send it. For you shall go out with joy and be led forth with peace. The mountains and the hills shall break forth before you into singing, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorn shall come up the fir tree. So instead of a, a, a you know, Im, a unprofitable plant comes a profitable plant. Instead of the briar, thorns and briars shall come up the myrtle tree. And it shall be to the Yahuwah for a name and for an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. Hallelujah. So keep in mind, when we water, sometimes we can overwater. And this is what he's saying right here. Um they were only giving them sufficient need for that time. Just like we can overwater somebody. If people are plants and we're just sitting there watering them all the time, what happens when you overwater a plant, especially a small plant? It dies. Don't overwater. John 4, 14. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Praise Yah. And think about this. It's the words. It's these words. His, so his words is likened to that water. And those words, if we live by them, it springs up into everlasting life. John 7, 37 through 39. In the last day, the great day of the feast, Sukkot, Feast of Tabernacles, Yahushua stood and cried, saying, If any man thirsts, let him come unto me and drink. He that believes on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit, which he that, they that believe on him should receive. For the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, was not yet given, because that Yahusha was not yet glorified. Isaiah 12. In that day you shall say, O Yahuwah, I will praise you. Though you were angry with me, your anger is turned away, and you comforted me. Behold, Elohim is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. For Yahuwah is my strength and my song. He also is become my salvation. Therefore, with joy, ye shall draw water out of the wells of salvation. This is again referencing what we're talking about. This everlasting well here that Yahushua is talking about. 
And in that day, you shall say, Praise Yahuwah. Praise Yah. Call upon his name. Declare his doings among people. Make mention that his name is exalted. His doings. What have, have you shared how amazing Yahuwah is with somebody lately? Have you shared your testimony of what he's done for you? Now is the time. Sing unto Yahuwah, for he has done excellent things. This is known in all the earth. Cry and shout, you inhabitant of Zion, for great is the Holy One in the midst of you. Isaiah 44. Yet now hear, O Jacob, my servant, and Israel, whom I have chosen. This is what Yahuwah said that made you and formed you from the womb, which will help you. Fear not, O Yaakov, my servant, and you, Jeshurun, whom I have chosen. For I will pour water upon him that is thirsty. Is anybody thirsty out there for his word? I am. Two hands up on that one. And floods upon the dry ground. Listen, it's been a dry ground for centuries. After the uh, early uh, apostles started dying off and getting martyred, the faith started slowly started slipping into apostasy and to just full-blown apostasy. Uh, that uh, a faith without keeping his commandments, without keeping his Torah. But now, since the, the ground has been dry for so many centuries, now he's pouring his waters once again that, that the... The true plants, the, the beneficial plants are springing up because when you have parched and dry ground, you just have thorns and briars springing up like a desert, tumbleweeds, you know, those things you see. But now that he's pouring the water again, you're seeing these beautiful, beautiful plants coming up, these profitable plants, like he was saying earlier in the earlier Isaiah passage, 55. For I will pour water upon him that is thirsty and floods upon the dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon your seed and my blessing upon your offspring. And they shall spring up as among the grass, as willows by the watercourses. One shall say, I am Yahuwah's. And another shall call himself by the name of Yaakov. And another shall subscribe with his hand unto Yahuwah and surname himself by the name of Israel. It's kind of interesting. You kind of see people doing this in the movement, like renaming themselves. Psalm 42. As the heart or the deer pants after the water brooks, so pants my soul after you, O Elohim. My soul thirsts for Elohim, for the living Elohim. When shall I come and appear before Elohim? So, are you thirsty out there, my friends? Just like good old Alan Horvath used to say, to be washed by and to grow in his word. Let's do it. Are you ready? We're kind of at the end of the study, so it's like, why would you ask me if we're ready now? Anyways, all right, we talked enough about the well. So again, he's talking about this well, and that his his words are likened to a well that is not able to be exhausted ever. Okay, chapter 3, verse 24. One of the disciples asked, How shall we judge what people do, whether it be good or whether it be bad? Yahushua said, If you are unsure whether a person's actions be good or bad, incline in his favor. Wow, could this movement really use this. Give them the benefit of the doubt. Even the secular world says, Innocent until proven guilty. But for some whatever reason in this movement, people act the opposite. And people cast stones and people call people guilty without even giving them an opportunity or even looking at evidence. Let's read this again. Yahushua said, If you are unsure whether a person's actions be good or bad, incline in his favor. If anything may be interpreted favorably or otherwise, then interpret favorably. Give them the benefit of the doubt. Even though you're like, huh, I don't know about that. Give them the benefit of the doubt. Listen, do not seek for wrongdoing. This is such, this is so profound. Do not seek for wrongdoing like dogs chasing a foul smell. And I see this in this movement, especially people that came into Torah through conspiracy. I am not against conspiracy topics because I also, through exposing lies and uh, and, and looking at conspiracy topics, brought me into the truth. It's like I was researching like, okay, um, Freemasons, what, what are they? Uh, oh, why, why are they like this brotherhood? Um, you know, why do you, just a handful of families um, own all the wealth? And why, uh, you know, why did, did uh, what, since when does jet fuel burn through steel? Um, hmm, interesting. Why are all these things happening? And, you know, whatever. That led me on a journey of truth to, to the Father's word. But the thing is, people get so used to that, that they go, they, they are like dogs chasing a foul smell. <laughs> You're wrong. You're wrong. You're a Freemason. You're you're a shill. That's probably a bad impersonation. That's what people do. 
If a good man does something appearing to be bad, then withhold judgment, wondering whether there be some good motive behind it, yet do not be easily hoodwinked. If one with a bad reputation does something seemingly good, question his motives, but bear in mind that no man is either wholly good or wholly evil. Let's take a look at um, the book of Sirach again, another book of just great wisdom. Sirach 324 says this, For their hasty judgment has led many astray, and wrong opinion has caused their thoughts to slip. <sighs> That's also why I've seen this movement. People are just looking for something. They're looking for a reason to hate somebody. They're looking for a reason to this. They're like a dog chasing a foul smell. Let me read this again. For their hasty judgment has led many astray, and wrong opinion has caused their thoughts to slip. Think about it. Don't be like a dog chasing a foul smell. All right, last verse we're going to read today. We're going to stop here. Yahushua said, Fortify yourselves with knowledge of truth as I have imparted to you. Rejoice in the knowledge that you stand within its everlasting light. Hallelujah. Oh, yeah, this, okay. I was wondering why I had this earlier, and I was like, well, this doesn't really go with it. But hey, let's read anyways. Psalm 119, 142. So he says this. Fortify, fortify yourselves with the knowledge of truth. Well, what is the truth? Your righteousness is an everlasting righteousness and your Torah is the truth. That is a defining verse that helps us unlock other verses. Proverbs 6.23 says, Your commandment is a lamp and the Torah is light. Are we starting to see here? So, so he says, Fortify yourselves in the knowledge of the truth as I have imparted it to you. Rejoice in the knowledge that you stand within its everlasting light. So the Bible defines, the canon defines Torah as being the truth and being the light. So again, let's read this. Fortify yourselves with the knowledge of the truth as I have imparted to you. So we're, we're using him as our perfect teacher of how to interpret the Torah. And that's how this whole book started, that he is the interpreter of the Torah for us. Rejoice in the knowledge that you stand within its everlasting light. Psalm 43.3. Oh, send out your light and your truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me unto your holy hill and to your tabernacles. Because I can tell you what, brothers and sisters, we are not getting to New Jerusalem without walking in his Torah, without walking in his truth and his light. Let's read it again. Oh, send out your light and your truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me unto your holy hill and to your tabernacles. So, there's, and, and through this entire book, we're going to continue to show you that our Messiah taught Torah obedience clearly. You want to learn more about Torah? Read it for yourself. You want some help with understanding? There's plenty of ministries out there that do Torah teachings. We do one every week. Every every uh, um, uh, Shabbat night, we do a study of the Torah. We read a little portion and we talk about it. Not that I have all the answers, but I like to share what I believe the Most High has shared with me. I believe now is the time to understand His Torah and to walk in it with all of our heart, soul, and mind. With the understanding that Messiah gives us. Malachi 2 6 the law of truth was in his mouth and iniquity was not found in his lips he walked with me in peace and equity and dare, did turn many away from iniquity so with that brothers and sisters um, I pray that this was somewhat a blessing um, if I can just be so bold to say this the book gets better as we read it I'm not trying to pitch it but I just I know that the first couple chapters is like eh you know Chapter 3 starts getting good. Chapter 4 and beyond is just amazing. So I pray that you'll stick with us and, and read this. Uh, again, uh, there is a free PDF for this. Uh, I'll make sure that's in the description box below and uh, in the uh, pinned comment. There's also an audiobook reading of the entire book. So if you prefer to listen or like, you know, if you're in your commutes or whatever, that's also free. For those of you that want a book in your hand, it is available for purchase. But know that this book is for free. First and foremost, but we do know we had this available because we know people would actually want to hold them in, hold it in their hand, and I get it. But for those of you that just want it free, it's free. So, anyways, with that said, uh, blessings to you all. Um, I look forward to studying the rest of this book with you, uh, line by line. And my whole goal of this is to grow together. And I believe this book has a lot of information to help us refine our walk and to grow together. So let's pray. Father Yah, we just thank you again. Uh, we just bless you for all that you do for us. And we just ask that you'd continue to strengthen us with your Ruach HaKodesh, that we may know truth and may know your light and may be ready at the return of Messiah Husha. And we want to just do what's right. Father, we want to serve you and, ser and, and, and we want to love you and love people with all of our heart, soul, and mind because it's the right thing to do. And we want to do it, Father. Help us, guide us, teach us. 
We bless you and thank you for sending Yahusha to die on a cross for us. In his name we do pray. Amen. Hallelujah. Shabbat Shalom. If you want to join us, the Torah portion uh, should be um, here in about 10, 15 minutes. It's going to be Exodus 6, 2 through 9 something. It's the plagues. So, Shalom. What are we going to play today? I don't know. Let's, let's do a song. Let's do a song. Let's do... Do I have the Seed of Abraham? Oh yeah, Seed of Abraham.
Finally returning